All right, turkey is in the oven now. We let it cook at two degrees for 25 days, and we will have ourselves a Thanksgiving. You remember to stuff the turkey full of Halloween candy? Sure did. Perfect. Finally found a way to combine our two favorite holidays, Halloween and the candy sales the day after Halloween. Let's do a candy roll call. You put in the Tootsie Rolls? Yep. You put in the Fun Size Kit Kats? Check. You put in the Smarties? No. <sighs> Dummy! You got Boston baked beans for brains? Where's your head? Uh, it's that time of year again. I'm a little distracted. The Force Awakens trailer is out. You can't do this every year, okay? We try to make these intros timeless so that our listeners can play them for their children because then we'll have two listeners. Why are you so obsessed with trailers? <sighs> <gasps> A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Daniel was gonna go to Tashi Station to watch the new movie trailers. You must put these childish things away, Luke. It's not what your father would have wanted. You never told me what happened to my father. Luke, your father was a great fighter in the preview wars, and an even better friend. So tender. He was killed by a bag of popcorn who insisted he go to the lobby. He didn't want to. Wait, I smelled butter flavoring on my way from... home. Luke, wait! Uncle Teaser? And coming attractions? Uncle Teaser! Luke! 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 I go by Daniel now. And that's how I met Sebulba. No, it's not. You ate my smarties and you don't want to admit it. Happy Halloween! Discounts. Discounts. Hello! We are on air, coming at you, from. live from inside of your tiny little iPod. That's where we've been all along. <laughs> Twilight Zone ending, that's where we've been all along. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you live in an iPod that's <laughs> as big as the world. You're in God's iPod now. <laughs> Good night! Everyone, everyone's eagle in God's iPod. <laughs> and you know what? We're all just on God's infinite playlist, and it's on <laughs> shuffle, baby. <laughs> So loosen up. Have a little fun. Do the hustle. <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Happy Halloween, if we didn't get to say it at the time. I don't remember recording those words. Yeah, I don't think we ever said the words, but we meant it. You yeah. know what we meant. We hope you had a nice Halloween. I hope you didn't eat anything that had razor blades in it. Yeah, if you did, I hope that's your thing. Yeah. Some Dollar Shave Club merchandise came through your door and you thought it was trick-or-treaters <laughs> that left some candy there. Neither Reverse. trick-or-treaters or Dollar Shave Club are our sponsors, so mm. we shouldn't be talking about them. No. We're sponsored by the fun size corporation <laughs> this month we will be covering something we covered last year equally sort of sort of sort of we're yeah. covering the flip side of what exactly. we covered last year for the thanksgiving episode we're all giving thanks we're founding mm -hmm. we're, we're remembering the founding of this beautiful country well when squanto took his first ride on the yellow car it was a beautiful day because this is the Said island of blue dolphins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did we talk about that in the last one no i don't think we did i think the person who the island of the blue i think the island of the blue dolphins may be catalina island because i think the lady that the island of the blue dolphins is based on was like enslaved at oh, the oh san gabriel not enslaved but she was at the san gabriel mission i think okay not confirmed please don't write us emails yeah we don't want to read them no our google so dictate doesn't work anymore <laughs> and our eyeballs we don't have them we gave up our eyeballs for our Halloween parties. <laughs> they said we'd get them back. Nope. <laughs> Still waiting. Last year, about this time, we covered the Tongva, the original people of Los Angeles, and what happened to them when the Spanish came. In the missions. In the missions. And now you are going to be covering? Well, we're both going to be covering basically yeah. the early years, the official founding of Los Angeles, which is something we've never, we've always danced around yeah. it, the Maypole, the Mayflower, <laughs> but it, we never <laughs> dove into what exactly happened. Turns out not much. <laughs> yeah. We're going to cover the two early phases. Yeah. We're living in basically the fourth phase of Los Angeles. It was native, Spanish, Mexican, American, yeah. which is what I identify myself as. Native, Spanish, Mexican, American. Oh, okay. I'm just a people of the land, you know? <laughs> and I do the hustle whenever I can. I 
with, I am Daniel. Sorry, I'm oh, yeah. sorry I didn't formally introduce myself. <laughs> well, we're assuming that you're all fans and no one, there's no new listeners. No. You know, once you board well, the train, half first. of that's true. Hi, I'm Craig. Hello, Greg. Hi, Daniel. Okay. I will be covering the Spanish years mm -hmm. of Los Angeles, the founding up to the loss of innocence to Mexico. <laughs> okay. I will be covering when Mexico gains their independence, huh? Yeah. And One just man's independence <laughs> is another man's loss of innocence. <laughs> it was a simpler place where no one was free. If there's any Spanish listeners here, you might want to step out of the room now if you're listening to anybody. <laughs> Spaniards. Oh. <laughs> My caramba. <laughs> which was the official policy of Mexico towards their Spanish invasion. Let me check the scroll. I carumba to his head. <laughs> we sent it to you to not have a cow. <laughs> the cow's my livestock. The problem was they did not have a cow. <laughs> they just wanted a cow, man. Let's get it started. Please. Here we go. Daniel, A, one, sauce. If you listen back to Padre Issues, which mm -hmm. was our last uh, festive episode, yeah. which I implore you to, meaning beg you to, you will remember that at a certain point, I mentioned that a group of people branched off from the San Gabriel mission to do a little city founding. Tell me more about those people, please. Like we were saying, this is the parallel time frame. So everything that was going on in the mission episode mm -hmm. was going on at the same time as what we're talking about right okay. now. So if you play them both, if you sync up both episodes and play them backwards at the <sighs> same time, you're going to hear the tape of my bar mitzvah <laughs> which is in its own right devil worship <laughs> so as a brief refresher of what was going on here at the time alta california and the rest of what we now know as mexico was known as new spain mm -hmm. or as they called it for some reason nueva españa what is that even i know seriously let's google translate that because i don't know spanish i'm sorry but approaching from the north were those dastardly russians or as they called them nueva russians oh they didn't <laughs> oh i got excited God, you're so you, you know everything I'm just Gullible! Just gullible! The Russians were slowly starting to colonize the West Coast by way of fur trading outposts, which a lot of the times they actually did in tandem with the Americans, which mm -hmm. is kind of weird. They were obsessed with fur. They were fur daddies. <laughs> <laughs> the Tsar was into some mm, kinky stuff. <laughs> so they loved fur, and the best otter and seal fur was said to come from Southern California, mm -hmm. which I've been saying all along. No one believes you. <laughs> no, but when the, whenever the WWF comes and pickets my whaling boats, I'm just trying to say I need their fur. I need whale fur. That's my favorite thing about 60s beach movies is all the, the seal clubbing. <laughs> <laughs> favorite part of the 60s was the seal clubbing. Are you going seal clubbing later after this? I don't know. After the hop, the hopscotch. What's it called? After the sock hop? Sock hop. Thank you. Sock hop. God darn it. Dang it. Golly. <laughs> Gee darn it. My God. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish warned the Russians not to come into their territory, but the Russians never listened. No. Much later in 1815, a Russian fur trip with an American captain actually sailed to San Pedro and were captured and arrested and oh. sent. <laughs> they were sent as prisoners to Monterey, where they were then sent out to go get some fur as oh. prisoners. <laughs> and they made like a seal and slipped away. They Why would they think that? That is some Snake Plissken stuff. Hey, murderer, do you know how to shave my throat? <laughs> not too close now. Uh-oh. I know the perfect punishment. Let's make him do what we arrested him for. <laughs> so the threat of Russians spurred King Carlos III, the Trace, of Spain to implement a Trace Prong, that's three prongs, <laughs> colonization plan of Alta California. Yeah. So there were the missions, which we've talked about exhaustively, yeah. and there were the presidios, which uh -huh. were little forts that were placed relatively nearby to protect the missions. By relatively, I mean that the presidio that was protecting Mission San Gabriel was in San Diego, <laughs> so it's relative, yeah. uh, relative compared to say the North Pole. It's really funny reading all this and they're like, okay, we'll just take three day horseback ride to, to protect our thing. Yeah. I'm, like, what? I'm going to the beach. I'll see you in a week. <laughs> so the problem with having just these two establishments was that supply ships going all the way up to remote Alta California were rare. Yeah. There were only two a year and sometimes those wouldn't even show up. So the missions and the presidios were having really serious food shortages, especially since they not only had to feed the priests and the soldiers, but also the neophytes who were the natives they were Confirming, 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 yeah. Hey, are you Catholic? We're just confirming. <laughs> cool. You, you are now. <laughs> they kept insisting, absorbing all the natives into the mission, so their numbers kept growing and growing. Yeah. They didn't have food for this. So the Spanish really, they couldn't get a grasp on how to farm effectively in the LA climate, seeing as they were all priests and soldiers, and there was not much livestock around either, so they really depended on the supply ships. Yeah. There was only one man that saw that this was a problem, apparently. <laughs> Colonel Philippe de 
de Neve. I'm going to call him Nev, and I call her Neve Campbell. His friends called him Nev, Nev so I'm yeah. going to call him Nev. High five, Nev. Nev, come here. I want to give you an Alta Cinco. <laughs> so he was a very well-respected and successful Spanish administrator, and in 1775, he became the governor of both Alta and Baja, California. So in 1777, he even moved the governor's headquarters out of Laredo in Baja into Monterey in Alta. Yeah. So some people think of him as the George Washington of California. Nev had the idea to create a third establishment that would focus solely on food production to replenish the supplies of the missions and the presidios from within. They were called Pueblos. Los Angeles was a sleepy Pueblo town. I gotta sneak it in. The idea was to attract families who knew how to farm to these places, give them money until they could support themselves, Mm -hmm. and they would in return sell their crops to the presidios and the missions. Once this farm community was a success, it would attract more families and retired soldiers to live there, then eventually the natives that had been converted at the missions would move there also, then the entire community would grow, not only providing supplies, but also a source of new recruits for the Spanish army that was stationed at the Presidios, thus solidifying Spain's control of the region. So that was the plan. In 1777, Nev Mm. went on a scouting mission to examine the water and soil conditions of the areas between San Diego and San Francisco Mm. to find good locations for settlements. The first location was decided on in a plain near the San Francisco Bay that went on to be settled first because the food problems up there were more severe. This Pueblo became San Jose. For the second location, Nev revisited a spot first eyeballed by Spanish ojos much earlier by a man named Father Juan Crespi, who first came to the area in 1769 on his expedition from San Diego to Monterey. Mm -hmm. He saw the LA Basin and the then lovely LA River and the Keech village of Yangna right on its banks. And he knew... I just have to go steal that. (laughs) I gotta get me one of those. (laughs) He knew this place had potential because there was already a people living. (laughs) So naturally, he wasted no time in renaming all of it. There's a lot of controversy over what exactly the original name of the city was, Mm -hmm. but the story of where the name comes from remains constant. The day that Crespi arrived to the LA Basin was the feast day for St. Francis with his old chapel in Assisi. So this old chapel was on a very small parcel of land, which in Italy they would call a porziuncola, or very small parcel of land. Okay. So as a result... That's beautiful language. It, porziuncola. Pour your own cola. <laughs> as a result, Crespi named the river, the LA River, the Porsiuncula, which was the original name of the LA River. I'm sure there's a dirty word. You made a face. There's a little bit of a dirtiness no. There's a dirtiness in it. Don't giggle about little butts that I'm talking about. (laughs) I like little butts. So when it came time to name the actual Pueblo, they wanted, they named it Grande Culo. (laughs) Yo quiero Grande Culo. What's wrong with that? What's so funny? Why are all the natives giggling? Why are they all dancing? I don't get it. (laughs) 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 Senor Mix-a-Lot. Hey, Senor Mix-a-Lot. It's your cousin, Duke Mix-a-Lot. You know that new sound you've been looking for? Well, listen to this. (laughs) Do-do. Do, 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 do. <laughs> when it came time to name the actual Pueblo, they wanted to pay tribute not only to the land that this old Italian chapel was on, but also what was inside of that old chapel. Inside, there was a fresco of the Virgin Mary surrounded by angels, which is why the chapel itself was called St. Mary of the Angels at the Little Portion, but in Italian. Get out your, again, get out your Google Translate. <laughs> so depending on what document you're looking at or what historian you're asking, the city originally could have been Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles de la Porcia or El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora La Reina de Los Angeles del Rio Porcioncula. Those are just two examples of like any variation of those words kind of jumbled up. It could have been that. But the two main camps are that it was either called El Pueblo de La Reina de Los Angeles Mm -hmm. or El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles de Porcioncula. Just call it the angel stuff. It's called the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. (laughs) No more sports talk. Sorry. We know you don't like it when we talk about sports. The numbers are very (laughs) definitive. No ambiguity there. There's a lot of impreciseness regarding names and data in these early days. I don't know if you had the same sort yeah, of problem. Yeah, I had a lot of issues with that. Why? Did it happen like 300 years ago when no one took notes? It seems like the Spanish weren't very precise about things. Yeah. There's actually another reason in particular why some stuff got lost, but uh-huh. I'll get to that later. But a lot of it is just wishy-washy. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. it's called this. You know, yeah. it could be translated as this. Exactly. Uh, you know, numbers aren't always the same. <laughs> Time is a flat circle. <laughs> what does it matter? That's why the different plaques at the Pueblo and Olvera Street today will each tell you a different name of what the Pueblo is called. So no one... There's okay. a lot of debate on this, and we're going to settle it tonight. <laughs> we chained up two leading historians. <laughs> By the end of this episode, they will have killed each other, and the winner will become the new queen of Los Angeles. Because they're women. You didn't think a historian could be a woman, could you? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. 
You, you should rethink yourselves. Come on. It's 2015. <gasps> I got to get back in time. <laughs> if you want to learn more about Crespi and what his objectives were, listen again to our episode Padre Issues and then promptly rethink your priorities. Yep. So Nev de- Neve decided that Crespi's instincts were right and this area was the best spot to start a Pueblo. It was fertile land and it was strategically placed to shorten resupply routes going up to the north. So in 1779, Neve... I'm just calling... Uh, you know what? I'm going native. I'm calling him Neve. Yeah. You know, it's only one more syllable. What's one more syllable amongst friends? Yeah. Isn't that right, Gre? So in 1779, Neve submitted his proposal to create both California's second Pueblo of Los Angeles and to create a new Presidio in Santa Barbara, which would become the Presidio LA reported to when it was completed six months after LA was. I bet it's really boring. <laughs> yeah, but the restaurants are also really expensive. <laughs> So everyone wins. So everybody wins. It equals out. That's the seesaw. That is Santa Barbara. Suck it, Santa Barbara meekly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I think I hear the surf liner coming at me. <laughs> so the proposal was approved, and then came the process of actually making this happen. Yeah. To start a settlement, you need settlers. Yeah. There weren't enough married soldiers living around the San Gabriel Mission to found a Pueblo. So Bachelor Neve- town. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Bachelor city. San Gabriel. He was the saint of parties, wasn't he? <laughs> Fiestas. So Neve put a captain, Fernando de Rivera y Mon- Moncado, mm-hmm. Fernando de Rivera y Moncado. Why do I always get the hard name? Why can't I have a good American name like Frank? Frank Rivera. <laughs> so he put Fernando de Rivera y Moncado in charge of recruiting families from the mainland of what is now Mexico with a guy named Manuel Garcia Ruiz. So Rivera was the same guy who actually led the expedition to San Diego. They needed soldiers to come, but they also needed civilians as well, ideally farmers who knew how to grow their own food, yeah. and ideally, ideally farmers from a region with a climate similar to LA so they would know how to keep crops going in such a dry area. God, so precise. I know I said that the Spaniards were imprecise, but they're really precise. (laughs) Settlers gotta settle, you know? Neve wanted as recruits, quote, men of soil without vices or defects. We just found men who were soiled. Yeah. So they began searching in the Sinaloa and Sonora regions for any willing adventurers to settle the wild north. Mm -hmm. It took three months before they even got their first volunteer on May May 30th, Jesus. 1780, a man named Antonio Feliz via Vicencio. The problem was that even if anybody had actually heard of Alta California, nobody wanted to move there. Like, okay. if you heard of it, it wasn't for a good reason. <laughs> they initially wanted to get 24 civilian families, but after a year of recruiting, they had to settle on 14 civilian volunteers in their families and 15 soldiers in their families. What, are they going to Mordor? Why yeah, is it so hard to drum people up? There's a lot of similarities <laughs> to, to what happened in Lord of the Rings here. Out of those 14 civilian families. Two of them got their advance payment for the trip and disappeared. <laughs> so now they were down to 12. Great. Some people were eager to go, though. Three of the people that had volunteered had gotten married just to be eligible to wow. go on this trip. The reason they preferred married couples for this was because it would then lead to more families being started, okay. but also because they thought that married men would be less likely to keep raping all the native women, which oh is what was happening with all the God. single soldiers at Bachelor Mission in San Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, marriage is going to stop that, right? <laughs> By the time they got to the Pueblo, there were only 11 civilian families, for a reason I'll get to soon. This comprised 11 men, 11 women, and 22 kids for a total of 44 people. That's my favorite family comedy, 11 men, 11 11 11 women. This summer, (laughs) 11 men, 11 women. 22 children? It's like the Brady Bunch, but like <laughs> up the ante. Up the ante. So the heads of these 11 families, here they are. Maybe you have a name similar to these people. Okay. We don't. Jose Fernando de Velasco y Lara, Jose Antonio Navarro, Basilio Rosas. He was the oldest one. He was 67. Okay. Thousand years old. <laughs> Antonio Mesa, Via Vicencio, which I mentioned before. Jose Vanegas, Alejandro Rosas, Pablo Rodriguez, Manuel Camaro, Luis Quintero, and Jose Moreno. You got all that? Remember him? Etch them all on onto your body. These are heroes. Sure, they were just simple farmers. They were just simple moisture farmers. Are we still doing the intro? Yeah, I haven't stopped. I've been making X-Wing sounds this whole time. (laughs) So these people, they were called the Pobladors, which means the settlers or townspeople. That term is generally applied to the 44 civilians, but the soldiers were just as important, really. There are a few thousand people living today that are descended from the Pobladors, and many are a part of a group called Los Pobladors 200 that started in 1981 for the city's 200th anniversary. 
cursory as racial as it is yes. it's worth noting the races of these pobladors we talked about it a little bit in our central avenue episode uh-huh. of the 22 adults in the group only two of them were actually spanish four of them were native one was half native half spanish notice i'm not using the very specific racial terms that exist for yes. these sorts of things two were black oh i wow. used it <laughs> two were half black half spanish and all the women were either native or half black and half spanish that means that over half of the pobladors had immediate african ancestry quintero yeah. was even the son of an african slave oh, really? it wasn't just a bunch of leche white spaniards that were, <laughs> that, were com- <laughs> that were coming into town it was a pretty diverse group of people i'm wondering why these volunteers as it were why they're so eager to settle because they wanted a big piece of land that they could probably turn into something well yeah i think the i, I don't know like the i can't get in the mind of a poblador i think the draw was just like yeah i mean the same reason people from the east coast came okay to yeah. the west coast that's true that's like true. oh i can i'm a little adventurous but i still want to have a lot of land where i can be alone <laughs> but in spanish there's even a plaque at olvera street that notes the exact races of the pobladors which wasn't even officially recognized uh-huh. that most of these people were black until 1981 when that plaque went up if you can believe it some people are pretty racist about this no some no, of them <laughs> no stop, stop not talking. in my city stop talking right now some members of the poblador 200 even left the group because they didn't want to hear that they had black ancestors and they completely reject their African heritage. Wow. Great people. The descendants (laughs) of the founders of this city. So now that we've talked about race, let's talk about my second favorite topic, compensation. (laughs) The terms of the deal for the settlers, here's a little bit of, a little bit to goose them into wanting to do this. These were the terms of the deals. They were committed to this Pueblo for 10 years. I'm out. For the first five years, they were to get 10 pesos a month in pay and two reals a day for rations. I don't know. I'm assuming that's like $4 million. (laughs) Then after the five year mark, they became owners of their land and were given their own branding irons to mark their herds. And their rate was lowered to a flat 116 pesos and three and a half reals per year for the next two years. Then after that, 60 pesos a year for the next three years. And then at the 10 year mark, all the payments stopped. So you're on your own. They were loaned two cows, two mares, one calf, two goats, two mules, two oxen, and two sheep, which they had to pay back once their stock had grown. In addition, they got an anvil, a forge. To drop on competitors. <laughs> or any wily coyotes that may come by. A forge, six crowbars, six iron spades, some carts and wagons, and various tools that go with all this. That seems reasonable. They had five years to pay this off. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so the conditions and volunteers were all set. Now the question was, how would they transport this ridiculous amount of humanity, the sum 1,000 miles? miles from Alamos to LA. They decided on splitting it into three groups. Group one was the Pobladores who would cross the Gulf of California from Alamos to Laredo and then up the Gulf again to the Bay of San Luis Gonzaga and then on land to LA. Group two would be the soldiers and their families traveling that same route across the bay. Group three, however, would be led by Captain Rivera himself, (gasps) joined by a few other soldiers leading the entire thousand strong herd of the settlers' animals up the Daanza route through the main land and then across to LA. Road trip. That sounds <laughs> awful. Yeah. That sounds like the worst one. Like, no, nah, I want to go to the soldiers. <laughs> Your share is looking over 300 cows for the next four months. You don't want to do that? So February 2nd, 1781, the first two groups of Pobladores gathered at Alamos and they yelled, Ah, California! <laughs> and the journey began and they all sang, California, here we come. <laughs> it took a little over a week to cross the Gulf and they arrived in Laredo in early March where they were immediately struck by smallpox. Oh boy. On March 12th, and the group was scattered. Again, Lord of the Rings. (laughs) Most of the families had to be quarantined, but it was really only one family that got sick. This was the family I mentioned earlier, how we started with 12, but only 11 made it to LA. They didn't die, the 12th family, but they had to stay in Laredo for a while to recover, and in the end, they got sent to the Santa Barbara Presidio instead of the LA Pueblo. On March 12th, Antonio Mesa and a few other families from the two groups that had left from Alamos were allowed to leave, so they sailed up the Gulf once again to the bay, where they then traveled the rest of the way to San Gabriel, becoming the first Pobladors to arrive on June 9th, 1781. A second group arrived July 14th, and the last group of the settlers showed up August 18th. Nobody died on the journey, but some of them did arrive with smallpox again (laughs) and had to be quarantined to heal yet again. The third group, the city slicker cow herding group, that was headed by Captain Rivera, (laughs) they left two months after the others had left from Alamos. You remember how I said some of the exact dates and records of this trip were lost? Yes. Well, here is why. Rivera and his men herded the animals all the way to Yuma. They took the 310. And on July 14th, most of the group went ahead to the mission, but Rivera and a few other soldiers stayed behind to rest some of the herd that was too 
tired to go on right away. Since Yuma was on the Dianza Trail, Spaniards and their herds were constantly coming through here. The native Yuma tribe was not happy about this. Oh boy. Because these herds would always eat their crops, and the mega herd that Rivera had just brought in seemed to be the last straw because they ate the last straw. <laughs> <laughs> so while only the smaller Rivera led group was left, the Yuma revolted and massacred everyone in the settlements in the area, including Rivera and oh. his men. Then they drove away the rest of the herd, and all the records he had were lost. Then a few days later, the other part of Rivera's group came back from dropping off the herd at San Gabriel to find Rivera dead, and they themselves were attacked and lost some of their men. And with this incident, the Dianza Trail was pretty much shut down. <laughs> so now back to San Gabriel. Wow. <laughs> yep, we could have had so many more cattle. <laughs> Yuma! Yeah, you did it again! <laughs> so the romantic idea of the founding of LA is that on September 4th, 1781, all 44 Pobladors marched triumphantly out of the San Gabriel Mission to their new home nine miles away at the Pueblo with Neve waiting for them on the banks of the LA River and the Keech watching in amazement as they all marched in to take their land. <laughs> There's even a brick path from the mission to the Pueblo that supposedly traces their exact route. They have an annual walk put on by Los Pobladores 200 that follows this path every September 4th that you can go to. Mm -hmm. They've even been having a parade every year since 2011 on this day to celebrate the founding, but wake up, people. <laughs> in reality, there was no grand ceremony. The truth is that the families didn't even all walk down to the Pueblo together. Some of them skipped, others just hung back like, nah, <laughs> fair shouldn't be late. Yeah, some ran. They were just so excited. <laughs> like I said, after smallpox hit them in Baja, they got splintered into three groups that have arrived weeks apart, like I said, and since their contracts involved the Spanish government paying them constantly for the next 10 years, they wanted to get the timers counting down on those contracts as yeah. soon as possible, so as the groups arrived, they wasted no time in sending them straight to the Pueblo as soon as they could, no matter what time they came. Yeah, okay. So there was no grand ceremony. There was no dramatic meeting of land distribution. When those first few families arrived in June 1781, they just sent them right over to their new homes, and that was that. The city was founded. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're here? Yes. Over there. Yeah, sign this. Uh, go. Your bunk bed's over there. It started with a whimper of four families and four soldiers. That's all it was. Then as the rest of the Pobladores trickled into the mission, they were sent over there too. Now, where does the September 4th date come from that yeah. we all love to celebrate? That's just when the Pueblo's first financial records were recorded, and Neve submitted them to his supervisors, so that's when they considered it to really be official, I guess. So we're founded on an accountant's <laughs> late tax report. <laughs> Happy Financial Petition Day! <laughs> this is the most beautiful financial petition day I've ever seen. <laughs> Did you get me anything for a financial petition day? <laughs> yeah, I got you a notary stamp. <laughs> so it's really just an arbitrary date. Okay. So now for the Pueblo itself, in May of 1781, Neve came to San Gabriel to lay out the actual physical plans for the Pueblo. Okay. The location itself they decided on was pretty much on top of the Keech village of Yonga. Oh. That original location isn't exactly known because the Pueblo had to be moved definitely once and maybe twice to get away from the winter flooding of the LA River, yeah. the little Kula River. <laughs> the original location is believed to have been a little northwest of where it is now, sort of boxed in around what is now Spring and Main and New High Street, but okay. we don't really know for sure. We're going digging, <laughs> and we're going to find out for sure. I'm going to find Neve's skull. I'm going lizard people deep. <laughs> they were all eaten by the lizard people, so <laughs> we don't know where the foundations are. The layout was to follow a standard Spanish town design with the focal point of the Pueblo being a central plaza 200 feet wide by 300 feet long with its corners facing the points on a compass so as to minimize their exposure to the winds. Okay. The plaza was the town's communal area. What The plaza we have now is obviously it's not the original one. This one was built in 1818, so it's still kind of old, yeah, I, guess, I guess, for a plaza. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've seen older. I mean, it's no little portion of a CC. But <laughs> <laughs> the plaza was surrounded by public buildings on one side, and then the other three sides were populated with the homes of the Poblador families. Each home was about 55 feet by 110 feet and were originally made of willow branches and weeds from the LA River with mud stuck on top for the roof. Sweet. They were helped in making these by the Keech, but within a year, they were already living in adobe houses. South of the plaza, separated by an irrigation ditch they made out of the river that they called the Zanja Madre, which started around where North Broadway crosses the river now. Okay. Picture it? Yeah. You got it, baby. I'll see you there in the morning. <laughs> Floating. <laughs> <laughs> with cement on my feet. <laughs> so south of the plaza were the farm plots that each family was given to tend. Mm -hmm. They called these plots of land suerte, meaning luck, because again, they considered themselves so lucky to be given their own land. Right. So that was what LA looked like year one. But year one was not exactly promising. There was concern that the settlement wouldn't last. The crops didn't come in well. There were 11 families. Three of the families were banished from the Pueblo for being lazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 
You can get banished for they that? They were the Zafrans? The Gonzales? <laughs> <laughs> and then the Zaf Gollins. <laughs> the mission reported back to the mainland that to this Pueblo there arrived 11 Pobladors, and of these, eight alone are of any use. Wow. So Lara, Antonio Mesa, and Quintero and their families were deemed useless to the Pueblo and themselves, and the situation was considered serious enough that Padre, now Saint, Junipero Serra, oh boy. himself came up here to banish them and lay down the law. Don't like Padre. <laughs> Who dares <laughs> fo crucifix? Sarah even spent the night at the Pueblo itself on March 18, 1782. A saint in our midst. It was haunted. If he could last the night, then he got the village. <laughs> he could not last the night. <laughs> so on March 26 of that same year, the three families were expelled. Boy. Lara and Quintero went up to Santa Barbara, which seems to be the haven of all the ill and the lazy, and nothing <laughs> nothing was ever heard of Mesa again. Not so. much has changed. Mm. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Mm. Hey, they have good sushi. <laughs> Luckily, they had found another family that was willing to relocate up there to take their place, but a new 10th family didn't show up until 1786. Damn. So things were a little rocky at first, but spoiler alert, the city survived. <laughs> By April 1872, the Pueblo was mostly built and on its feet, so most of the soldiers that had come with them were sent to the new Presidio in Santa Barbara, because they sort of like, yeah, you got this. Yeah. You know, we'll be hanging out by the beach in Santa Barbara. They've got a really cool art walk. The early Pueblo crops were corn, pepper, and grapes that came from the mother vine at San Gabriel that we talked about. Again, refer to Padre issues. They were also eating a lot of beef jerky from the local beef jerky vine that we also talked about in Padre issues. Uh, Boy, was that thing coming in. (laughs) It's coming in thick and leathery. (laughs) As currency in the beginning before Spanish coins took over, they used the native ponco, which was a string of clam shells. The more clam on it, the more valuable it was. This is where calling money clams comes from. But it wasn't just a quiche thing. I think a lot of tribes did this. Ponco is also now a game on The Price is Right. Is it really? No. I think Plonko might be. I haven't seen The Price is Right. You can tell me anything about The Price is Right. I'm like, really? Look, he'll never believe. Let's tell him a little lie here. Drew Carey hosts it. (laughs) He'll never believe that. He's not even working anymore. That fat boy? Well, I got something. I got news to break, Greg. (laughs) There were no doctors in the early days there were no schools either. The only education around was at the mission, which was only educating the natives about Christianity. That was a school of hard knocks, am I right? <laughs> knocks meaning lashings. <laughs> yeah, like they beat you. <laughs> As a result, the military began educating people, but in 1793, the King of Spain ordered that schools be created in California to educate the colonists and the neophytes. So this was 1793. LA didn't get its first school until 1817. Oh, wow. <laughs> Someone named Maximo Pina was hired as the city's first schoolmaster. He made a $140 a year and wanted to give a secular education, but the people in charge disagreed, so still the only education around was about Christianity. <laughs> he taught kids how to read, but all they had to read were Bibles. <laughs> so Pina taught for two years and then left, and then there was no school in LA again for another 10 years. Who needs it? Good. School's out for summer. <laughs> for the next well, the 10 lo- years. Yeah, a lot of summer. The long summer. <laughs> long summer. <laughs> With all this Christian education, though, they still didn't have a church in the beginning. People would have to travel the nine miles back to San Gabriel if they wanted to go pray. The the first church opened in 1784, but the one that we know today that's there didn't open until 1822. There's controversy about the real name of this place also. Supposedly, its true name is La Placita de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles, but what it goes by now is La Iglesia de Nuestra Señora La Reina de Los Angeles, or the Church of Our Lady of the Angels of Los Angeles. Being able to ride a horse was a big point of pride amongst the Pueblo family, so they uh-huh. wanted their kids riding horses at a very young age. Right. As a result, almost every family in the Pueblo lost at least one kid to a horse riding accident. Oh my god. Yep, a lot of dead hey, kids that, out that. there. It wasn't all chaos though. There was a system of governing within the Pueblo. They were mm-hmm. policed by soldiers from the Presidio. A lot of the soldiers up in this part of the Spanish realm, however, were criminals oh. that had cut deals to serve out the rest of their sentences as soldiers on the frontier because nobody really wanted to do that. Yeah. Not a popular policy among the settlers as they didn't want their Pueblo to become a convict colony like yeah. Australia. So that was, <laughs> as it still is, they mostly put a stop to that eventually. In terms of an actual local government, there was an alcald, which was a sort of mayor slash judge, and two regidors, or councilmen. They were mostly honorary posts, but still, it's something. It's something. In 1786, Jose Vanegas, one of the pobladors, became LA's first alcald until 1788, and then again in 1796. One alcald seemed to have been Francisco Reyes from 1792 to 95, who also seemed to at one point own the land of Rancho Los Encinos, another important place in the early history of the city. Refer again, Padre issues. Don Francisco Avila 
became Alcalde in 1810, and in 1818, he built his Avila Adobe, which is now the oldest standing house in L.A. on what is now Olvera Street. Mm -hmm. This place later became the military headquarters of Robert Stockton of the invading American Army in 1847, which Greg will get to. A lot of the original Pobladors eventually went on and made names for themselves. Pablo Rodriguez eventually left the Pueblo and became the mayordomo of the San Diego Mission in Mm -hmm. 1807. A few of them are buried at Mission San Gabriel. Two of the guys that got banished, Laura and Quintero, had been godfathers to many of the natives that Sarah had baptized on his crazy baptism spree when he came to visit. (laughs) Everyone gets baptized! (laughs) Drink this! The last surviving Poblador, Maria Guadalupe Perez, died in 1860 at age 100. Wow, she made it. We just missed her. (laughs) Another offspring of these early days was the rise of the ranchos. Mm -hmm. Soldiers started to retire with dreams of owning some land of their own, and out of recognition to their service to the crown, it was granted to them. The first of these happened in 1784 when a soldier who had retired two years earlier named Juan Jose Dominguez petitioned Governor Pedro Faje? Fages? F-A-G-E-S. He petitioned the governor for a plot of land he always had his eyes on. He wasn't even stationed in L.A. He had been the oldest soldier in the San Diego Presidio, but on his trips up to L.A., he fell in love with the land that he ended up naming Rancho San Pedro. This land made up what is today Compton, Redondo, San Pedro, Wilmington, and the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Big area. A huge area. Not long after, another soldier named Jose Maria Verdugo heard how much land Dominguez had gotten and decided to try it for himself. He got an area that he named Rancho San Rafael. Rafael, which became pretty much all the land north of the Pueblo to where Glendale now is. Okay. Then just a month after that, a third soldier named Jose Manuel Nieto was awarded Rancho Los Nietos, which is today the areas near Whittier all the way down to Long Beach and cutting into Orange County. Oh, wow. Huge swaths yeah. of land. Another significant rancho was granted to a corporal in the Pueblo Guard named Jose Vicente Feliz, which he named El Rancho Nuestra Señora de Refugio de Los Feliz. Today, we know it as Los Feliz okay. and part of Griffith Park. That land grant was where the curse of Griffith Park began so listen back to the original creepy haunted episode now that you have a little more context you (laughs) might like it finally (laughs) nope nope still don't oh okay okay that's fair at first the ranchos were just meant to be grazing grounds for these soldiers livestock and they were supposed to come sleep at the Pueblo at the end of the day but these were such spread out parcels of land that that just wasn't convenient so nobody did that and nobody really enforced it anyway this worried the people in charge because all this was stealing land that belonged to the Keech as it was yeah and having Pueblo people now sleeping and living on their land was bound to upset them even further. This was also going against Neve's original intention for the Pueblo. Soon enough, pretty much everywhere outside the Pueblo was a rancho. Four times as many people lived on the ranchos than did in the Pueblo. So from the very beginning, LA was a massive sprawl. Yeah. There's no, it just is. It always is and it always was. <laughs> that's 17- weird to think of. Sorry to interrupt, but that's so weird to think of because I was blaming like Pacific Electric and everyone's like, no, just we, we keep going farther out and then we'll build the rail and that's how everyone's clicking. No, you're, you're right. It was always, it it was always like that. <laughs> <laughs> Between 1784 and 1821, the Spanish governors gave out around 25 ranchos. 15 of those were within what is now LA County, but not all was well. The intended system of the Pueblo creating supplies to sell to the Presidio was not quite working. They still depended heavily on the Spanish supply ships, but they were so unreliable and were steeply marked up. And on top of that, the soldiers had first crack at the goods, so there wasn't much left for the civilians, which caused a certain degree of discontent, and they were only allowed to trade with the Spanish ships. Okay. It was punishable by death to trade with ships from any other country, but there was still legal trading going on. They didn't care. No one cares. (laughs) There's so much space, you're never going to catch me. Ships from New England would regularly come here and dock at Catalina Island and sail small boats into the coves around Palos Verdes and do business with people, illicit business. Ooh, dirty. Sexy business. After hours. (laughs) This sort of thing happened regularly up until 1821 when Mexico took over and eased the trade restrictions. Mm -hmm. Little did we know, the story of LA is actually partially tied up in the story of Napoleon. It's weird to think about because all this, I mean, Napoleon was conquering Europe at the same time that all this was happening. crazy. Yeah, it's really weird to think about. The outfits were so different. In 1808, Napoleon got rid of Spain's King Ferdinand VII and put his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne. Joe Boney. Joe Boney, yeah. And then Zamboni was (laughs) invented in Los Angeles. Uh, Malfunction. (laughs) Episodes blending together. 
Putting his brother on the throne sort of knocked Spain off of its feet, and even though Ferdinand did come back into power two years later, it had already sparked Mexico to fight for its independence starting in 1810, and with Spain having Napoleonic troubles of its own, it started to lose its grip on Mexico. That meant losing its grip on Los Angeles. Eventually, supply ships stopped coming to LA altogether. Soldiers stopped getting paid. No new padres were being sent to replenish the missions. Obviously, the Spanish government's priority were the presidios, so any supplies that they did have were going to them. And then they started taking all the supplies that the Keech were making in the missions, which led to the Keech being worked even harder than they were at the missions for no extra pay. And this further strengthened the trend of many of the Keech coming to work in the houses of the Pueblo as servants or in the fields of the ranchos to earn a living rather than joining the missions. They didn't make much money doing it this way because the Pueblo and Rancho residents didn't have much for themselves. They didn't really get much, but at least they were free doing this. Yeah. This meant that the missions got even weaker. And then finally in 1821, Mexico was formed and inherited control over Los Angeles. LA was so remote that they were always kind of left to their own devices like we were saying. So there was no big battle or heroic last stand in this transition as far as I can tell. It was kind of like the founding. It came with a whisper and it ended with a whisper. <laughs> in 1800 the Pueblo's population was 315 and by the time it came under Mexican rule it had some 650 citizens making it the largest population in Alta California. So while the presidios and the missions faded away into historic novelties, the Pueblo remained and continued to grow into the giant Pueblo that we now live in. And now, Greg, we're there, 1821. Who are all these new Mexicans? <laughs> Which is a question we ask ourselves all the time. Yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> you brought us to 1821. Let's carry on a little bit. In trying to create a decent enough timeline for myself, I found the most effective way to do this was to map out the 11 Mexican governors of Alta California, mm -hmm. or the term I prefer, Jefes Politicos, <laughs> which gives us some of the best men who looked over this region and also some of the worst. Donald Trump. <laughs> I wish I knew how to say his phrase in Spanish. You're fuegoed. You're fuegoed. <laughs> You're fuegoed. That's not Spanish at all. Please don't. <laughs> please do not turn around and to say. To us fuegoed. <laughs> we got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. Right. You can go home, Mr. Trump. Thank you. <laughs> You're all fuegoed. <laughs> it's funny saying a phrase that Donald Trump says in Spanish because we know how he feels about the language, the people. He likes him. Loves them. It made it easier for the timeline too because a lot of the major events and shifts in power all have something to do, are all tied to the governors of the area. So if I followed the path of governors, you follow the path of events as well. So that was pretty much the way I did my research. So I left a path of governors to get out of the enchanted forest once. <laughs> Proceed. <laughs> they just wandered off though. They were no help. Yeah. So I'm going to name all the 11 men who ran Alta California for the 27 years that was ruled by Mexico. Isn't that interesting? 11 Pobladors, 11. We each have 11. <gasps> <gasps> oh my God. It's like that Jim Carrey movie. Wasn't there, liar, liar. <laughs> wasn't there 11 men in Lord of the Rings? The men who had the ring? Oh my god, were there 11 in the Fellowship? Was No, not in, the, not in the Fellowship. Oh, uh, the, the 11 men. I think there were 11 in the Fellowship also. What is happening? Are we Wiccan? <laughs> <laughs> I think I practice Kabbalah now. <laughs> What's happening here? Governors of Alta California. First one, Pablo Vicente Sola, who ran from 1815-1822. Sola was in the seat already when we became he a like, foot in both worlds. Exactly. He, trans he was a transfer over. Mm -hmm. He was a segue. So the first actual governor of California that got put in there was Luis Aguello, 1822 to 1825. After that, Jose Maria de Enchidia from 1825 to 1831. Manuel Victoria, who ran from 1831 to 1832. Pio Pico held office for the first time for 20 days in 1832. After that, Jose Enchidia returns but rules from the south from 32 to 33, while Agustin Zamorando rules from the north. Two governors at the same time. After him was Jose Figueroa from 33 to 35. Jose mm -hmm. Castro followed him. Figueroa is a familiar name. Yeah, a lot of these names. So is Castro. What do you communist? What, I, what's happening? After him, Nicolas Gutierrez ran for four months in 1836, and then Mariano Chico for another three months in 1836. After him, Juan Bautista Alvarado from 36 to 42. After him, Manuel Mitrotrena from 42 to 45, and then Pio Pico, 45 to 46. Almost and, a bookend. Almost a bookend, look at that. And then for the last couple days before they surrender, 1846, late 1846, early 47, General Jose Flores covered after that. As you walked us through, the Spanish and the Mexicans decided this ain't working, and Mexico takes Southern California, or as it was called then, Alta California. Of Mexico's rule over California, I've heard a lot of terms like political turmoil and constant state of revolt, but really I didn't get a sense of that in, in my readings. They were like difficult times, but the way I look at it, it was such a large space from San Diego to Monterey, and it was such fresh territory, so things are just like rocky. So I don't think of it as like tumultuous or anything. It's just like, we're trying to figure it out. Like, it's bad. It's kind of good. We haven't figured it out. They're just trying to get a footing on everything. And then with like Manifest Destiny and the move west to cover the land between the Atlantic to Pacific, it proved difficult even more so to like experiment with 
several laws and territories because like it seemed like everything was happening all at once. So like them trying to like establish themselves made it even harder with the Americans coming from the east. When they were first settling in, however, the Mexican government had a huge change in mind for California. And we touched on this before in, in Padre Issues, which was the secularization of the like missions. I such a casual phrase. I know. There. But you know, Padre Issues? You have Padre Issues, sure, right? Everyone knows it. <laughs> the Mexican government's intent was to free up the land from the missions and idealistically give the head of each Native yeah. American family a plot of land yeah, and cattle. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so they could yeah. establish themselves. Great plan. <laughs> they also, oh, yeah, it was a great plan. Great execution, <laughs> I should say, sarcastically. <laughs> that was sarcasm. Let's also mention that they wanted to give a lot of land to their friends, which, you know, for the yeah. ranchos, yeah, remember, which they did. Yeah. The spearhead of this plan was the third governor of Mexico, Governor Echendia, who had been plotting this since 1826, his second year in office, but wouldn't get the chance to put it into effect until 1834, after the Mexican Secularization Act of 1833 was decreed. This was huge for California because it meant that it wouldn't be a religious-run state any longer. We can finally worship Quarwar again. Ah, <laughs> oh, long live Quarwar! <laughs> is it Quomar? Who is it? Quarwar. Quarwar? Quarwar. I remember you said Quomar at one point. Yeah, I'm, I, was, I was tired. <laughs> I apologize to the Tongva <laughs> listeners. Quarwar, please release me! Do not mock Quarwar, please. <laughs> Secularization pans out for the state because now settlers and simple folk can own the land they work, but it doesn't work out so well for the Tongva or any of the Native American tribes people like you were saying. Because dividing up the land and giving each family their own lot to look after doesn't work for uh, people who come from communal tribes giving yeah. up the land. It was just a complete like clashing of how the world works yeah, between yeah. the two people. And they were enslaved that entire time and like there is such a thing as institutionalization. So like now you're free. Return to like no we don't like we don't remember. So eventually <laughs> what, what happened to Yang Na? <laughs> so eventually what happens is after their farms don't bring in any profit they have to sell the settlers and begin working as a dentured slave on their farms to pay off the debts basically and then just returning to a life that you were mentioning before like just returning to the lives of slaves. But honestly good intentions from the Mexican I mean that is kind of good intentions from Mexican government. None of this were was done with bad intentions yeah, really. But still. It's misguided intentions. Yes it's misguided <laughs> intentions exactly. It's just ignorant misguided intentions. I think we found the, the title of this episode which is ignorant misguided <laughs> intentions. Yeah Enchidia seems like a good guy. The genuine article you know. Was that article feminine or masculine? <laughs> a little from column A a little from column B. <laughs> Why do they have to be one or the other? We live in 2015 now. <laughs> so taking the seat directly after him was almost the complete opposite person. Manuel Victoria, who governed California from 1831 to 1832, asked me why it was just one year. <laughs> Victoria was more of a military minded man, more than a man of the people, and he was just very forceful character. As an aside, I love in all these readings, when you were bad at your job, at being a governor, they called you unpopular. <laughs> I, I prefer the term infamous, because you're popular, but not for a good reason. Anyways, what makes people look at Victoria as the opposite of Enchendia is that, other than being the opposite of his personality, he also sought to directly reverse secularization. He like refused to push territorial legislature into action and he refused to convene the departmental assembly. The citizens began to oppose him because he was not breaking the law by enacting this reform. He was just pretending like there wasn't one. So to retaliate against the citizens, he had around 100 people in prison and exiled the two leading opposers, God. Jose Carrillo and an American. That's like, that's like a tenth of the population <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Whittier is under arrest. <laughs> We're gonna need a bigger handcuff. <laughs> so Jose Carrillo, one of the leading opposers, got exiled and so did an American, Abel Stearns, got exiled to Baja, California. Boo-hoo. So, Boo-hoo. Boo-hoo. Uhu, baha. <laughs> so of course, Californios, which if you were born in California or thought yourself as a, more of a Californian, you were called a Californio, won't stand for a tyrant. So in 1831, November of that year, a group of rebels banded together by Juan Bandini, Juan Carrillo, who's one of the guys who got exiled, and future governor, Pio Pico, along with his brother, Andres. These men and their Angelina rebels joined forces with troops from the Presidio in San Diego, and the two groups marched on Los Angeles to oust Manuel Victoria, who was marching south from Monterey. And he wants to squash this insurgency. So he has about 30 men. The rebels have 150. <laughs> This is the first Battle of Coanga. Pay attention, there's two. They call it the Great Battle of Coanga. <laughs> the one. Battle of Coanga to end all Battle of Coanga. <laughs> this ain't your mama's Coanga <laughs> battle. This ain't your Poblador's Coanga. <laughs> so the Coanga Pass is important when it comes to this area because you pretty much had to pass through it to get from the southern regions of to the Universal state. Universal Studios. To Universal Studios. It's so weird because I keep picturing it in my head, <laughs> but I always picture the 101. Like they're yeah. like the horses are on the 101. I'm like, no, no, there wasn't anything there. It was just hills. <laughs> How did they get around the time <laughs> blade? <laughs> what was their exit? Yeah, if you're curious where the Kamwinga Pass was, it is now around the area of Universal Studios. But before the path was set in, the Alley River ran through the pass and into Hollywood, which was later rerouted mm. through Griffith Park. It was not only the access point to the valley, it was also a really hilly terrain, so it was good for, like, strategic moves, strong military grounds, because there was a high ground and a low ground, and it was good for, like, troops and stuff. And the things. low ground's the better ground, right? 
Yeah, you definitely want to be low so you could see what they're doing when they're above you. <laughs> so you could really see the bullet coming at you. <laughs> it makes a great silhouette against the sunlight. I love being blinded before I get shot. There are some different accounts on things, so I'll try to present any confusion I had on what, because I keep reading like, this guy did this, and I'm reading another another thing like, no, that guy did this. Like, but who, and I can't like, I don't know how to clear it up. These early days, they really don't seem to be that well documented. No. This seems like it should be because there's, I, I got a lot of information from like military websites of like, this is how this I called the down. Pentagon. <laughs> So Victoria and his men met the rebels at the mouth of Coinga Pass. He saw the commander of the rebel group from San Diego was a man he knew, Pablo de la Portilla, and he ordered him and his men to join the ranks. Portilla refused and rode out on a horseback to battle, which <laughs> angered Victoria, and he ordered his troops to fire. But here's the thing about that. Because the communities were not that large, soldiers on both sides of the battle were familiar with each other <laughs> and had no real intention to hurt anybody. So John? <laughs> hit Kurt. See Kurt? Hit Kurt. <laughs> so when the orders came from Victoria to fire, the soldiers fired above the heads of the opposing rebels. Oh. Whether this was an agreement, it was like a pre-planned thing or all the soldiers were just hoping no one noticed if yeah. I didn't shoot anybody. <laughs> they all had the same yeah, idea because like, oh, they're all from the same family. <laughs> <laughs> then the rebels retaliated in the same way, just wasting shots. Huh. The fact that after the guns were fired and everyone was still alive was obvious proof that like nothing was going to happen. Good war, guys. <laughs> good war. <laughs> Can we go home? See you at the barbecue. All ghosts, huh? <laughs> you look good for a casualty. So then I read this happened. I'm not sure if it's true, but I'm going to say it anyways. Maybe if someone wants to dispute me, that's fine. Mr. Magoo <laughs> stood in front of all the bullets. Bruno! One of the victorious soldiers, Captain Jose Pacheco, got the command wrong, and instead of firing his rounds, he charged the rebels on horseback. He wasn't shot because he was actually in what the normal line of fire would be, and since no one was shooting there, he would just simply pass through. He came to a halt. Oh, God. <laughs> which, if you've seen Dances with Wolves, that's exactly what happened. He came to a halt about halfway when he realized that nobody else was out there, and then the leader of the rebels, Captain Jose Avila, took offense at this mistakenly bold move. Avia was, by the way, one of the people imprisoned by Victoria and came out. Avia and Pacheco met on the battleground, and they met for a single combat with lances. Oh, with lances? With lances. And both were excellent horsemen, so it was a good fight. Huh. Pacheco at some point got the advantage over Avia and knocked the lance out of his hands, to which Avia responded by drawing a gun and shooting Pacheco in the back and killing him. Victoria hmm. was infuriated by this, as was I, so he shot and killed Avia. Uh -oh. uh, now the battle starts. Yeah, I also read that Avia was the one who attacked Manuel Victoria with a lance and scarred him, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me since there's only two casualties of the Battle of Coenga Pass, and they were both Pacheco and Avia. The other account, which I, I'm guessing is true, is that Portilla was the one who charged Victoria and put a lance through his face, tearing a big chunk of his precious flesh off. After that, it was pretty much done. <laughs> After he was wounded, his troops weren't really into fighting, so and then it was like, enough's enough. Victoria was taken to San Gabriel Mission to have his wounds treated, and after that, he formally surrendered to his predecessor, Jose Enchadilla, who was governor before he came in. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. The governor's seat was shared by Enchadilla and Pio Pico through 1832, and in January of 33, the duties of governor were given to Jose Figueroa, who fought for Mexico's independence years earlier. He served California while organizing territorial and local government after Victoria had dropped the ball so badly. But Figueroa left office in 1835 from failing health and appointed Jose Castro to the governor's seat. Castro had been another citizen who would have built up a resistance against Victoria. Around this time, in 1835, Texas separated from Mexico. Remember the Alamo, but it hadn't happened yet, so there's nothing to remember. <laughs> Mexico was set on not losing California to the United States, but it was getting harder. Mexico never necessarily had a heavy hand in this area, and after the land from the missions opened up, not only did Californios were moving in, but so were Americans coming from the north and the east. And they're also joining in on fights too, so you're kind of seeing like it's mingling, mingling. And Americans like, love a good fight. <laughs> they can't stop fighting. So after Castro was Nicolas Gutierrez, who had served along with Castro in the Mexican Revolution. He wasn't particularly good at his job, and they called him Al Huerto, because he had a squint in his eye, it means one eye. God. That didn't make him bad at his job. Well, you know, maybe it did, but it was a handicap, so you know, be nice. But he was seen as tactless and completely unconcerned with the people of California and didn't know what they wanted, didn't know how to give it to him. Although he was in charge of secularization of the mission of San Gabriel, which was good in many ways, he also had the opportunity to make Los Angeles the capital of the state instead of Monterey. And he was sort of pushing for that because the area was becoming more prominent in the state. But the people were against it since there was only two or three administrative buildings and the owners of the buildings refused to offer them to the governor. So that plan was a bust. So at this point, with a seemingly incompetent governor and the removal of the mission system and nothing foundational to replace it yet, California was in like a strange limbo state. No pun intended. <laughs> I've always thought of us as the limbo state. <laughs> That's It looks good on the flag. After Gutierrez had tried to move the capital south, Mexico began to implement war rules on the citizens, which many found to be, just be unjust. And of course, a citizen revolt began against Mexico. The revolt was led by a Monterey native named Juan Bautista Alvarado, which many recall was a brilliant politician and was a very courteous man. He, along with a band of conservatives, 
concerned citizens felt that the Mexican government was neglecting California, which they were. And just like a long distance relationship, you know, maybe we should spend some time apart. <laughs> Alvarado and his group managed to force Gutierrez's surrender and declare California as an independent state with hopes of gaining a federal system of government. It wasn't quite official yet though, because although through many weak attempts, Mexico still wanted some control of California, even though at this point they were pretty much seen as a losing battle. You know, if small factions of wealthy landowners can join up and keep fighting a Mexican government, I don't think we're going to win this. <laughs> the problem with all of this was that no government officials recognized Alvarado as the governor, and Alvarado was not interested in giving up his governor's chair to anyone who was interested in progressing California. You know, he was really a man of California. The government officials, which included Juan Bandini and Pio Pico, who were involved in the Battle of Coenga Pass, sent a group of officers north to Los Angeles to remove Alvarado from office. One of the officers was Captain Portilla, who you might remember was a man who scarred Manuel Victoria. <laughs> the man but, with the scar? But the man with the scar, no, the man who gives the scars. But their attempts at removing him failed. This one, I believe, was stopped because Alvarado sent troops to again stop the southern Mexican troops from getting the jump on him. Mexican officials weren't happy with Alvarado, and he had a few guys in line to become governor, but political strife and different battles were getting in their way. There was just a huge dispute over the legality of Alvarado's move as governor, so he discontinued on that way, and as far as I can tell, was a decent governor. His secularization was in effect, and he began to parcel out land grants to people, and the ranchos started springing up. Even more. 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 More ranchos for everyone. <laughs> in August of 38, uh, a ship arrived at Monterey with a letter to Alvarado from Captain Andreas Castorillo in Mexico City that he had been successful in getting Alvarado's appointment and became official. He was a governor in 1840. But his downfall was already starting to come into effect. There was a lot of land disputes because he was dishing out land and he wasn't really the governor, so they were able to take some of it back. Governor Alvarado and his commanding general Vallejo, which was his uncle, began to fight over whether two people could hold the governor's position or not. Now, there's some confusion on my part. I can't tell if Vallejo... Why is that even a question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a governor's bench. I can't tell if Vallejo wanted both of them to be governor or if he thought only one man could do the job and he wanted to do it. This happens when you appoint yourself as governor and get your <laughs> uncle to be a high-ranking official. The result of all this needless arguing was that they were both fired and Mexico appointed a new governor, the last to be sent from Mexico. So after Alvarado comes Manuel Mitchell Turina, who rivals Manuel Victoria's reign as the person opposed to the people. He was <laughs> not a very good governor and he also had to be pulled from duty. Mitchell Turina was another tactless, military-minded creep who lacked sound judgment. Good for him. The war between the U.S. and Mexico seemed unavoidable because the United States planned to annex Texas as a state. Remember the Alamo, but not yet. So to help finance Prepare this- to remember. You better remember. It hasn't happened, but you better remember. <laughs> so to help finance the war, the Mexican government sent Mitchell Trinidad to California to collect taxes, which he brought with him an army of thugs. <laughs> These 300 or so convicts were Valens released from the jails of the states of northern Mexico. This army- Are we not Australia? We, <laughs> all, of, all of our soldiers were ex-cons. <laughs> And now they're bringing in thugs to keep us in order. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm not arguing with you. We are the Australia <laughs> of America. This army raided the ranchos of California, plundering, burning, torturing as they saw fit. It was a very legal crime wave that ran over Los Angeles. They were thieves and bullies, and every town that they went to had people turning against Mitchell Trulina, who completely supported their actions. They ran around stripping people of clothes, assaulting whale captains at ports. They were just no, nuts. Not the whale captains. Not the whale captains. But he was so close to getting the white whale. <laughs> Mitchell Trulina was just not a good governor. He would be calling like a meeting of assembly and not giving enough notice to like Pio Pico and the southern members to be present. So he'd call a meeting and be like I'll, I'll see you guys in a day. I know it takes five days to get up here. We're having a meeting on top of Mount Low in 20 minutes. <laughs> see you there. At some point he signed an agreement to send his convicts back to Mexico within three months but then violated it when he met stupid John Sutter, a Swiss settler from the north who was up to no good. Mitchell Trulina promised a land to Sutter and his men. He actually had a lot of Americans on his side probably because Sutter helps establish Sacramento. I didn't do a lot of research on him because he's up like north. Sutter mill? Yeah. Is that the Sutter's Fort. Oh, no. No, that's Sutter. So, obviously, and totally necessarily, former governors Jose Castro and Juan Alvarado began a revolt to oppose him in Los Angeles. This sounds like a very tumultuous time. You were saying it wasn't too tumultuous. Well, there's not it's a lot of... tumultuous. I've uh, heard the word revolt a lot more times but than you do in a peace-loving <laughs> era. <laughs> but here's the thing about it is that I don't think a lot of blood was shed. Like, I'm sure yeah. some people died, but it wasn't like, the massacre of something, yeah. something. <laughs> a lot of like, hey, you better cut it out. Like, <laughs> oh, all right. Right. Fine. As far as I can tell. But I'm scarring your face forever. <laughs> yeah, these armies were made up of, like I said, wealthy landowners, you know, because they know how to fight. <laughs> but this army, the revolting army, also had a lot of Americans in it. It was a revolting army. One of which, William Workman of La Puente, who was the uncle of William Workman, who we mm -hmm. we know as established Boyle Heights, also at some point yeah. was being robbed by Tabrisco Vasquez. <laughs> yeah. He also worked with Pacific Electric to extend the line to Alhambra Temple City in the early days. Mm -hmm. Same name, totally confused me. Not even a junior, because it's his <laughs> uncle. William Workman. Workman? This is William Workman. William, William Workman of the older days. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I was so sure it was him. And then like, that kind of doesn't make sense. He would be like 100 years old. <laughs> and then I looked up the dates and he was born in like 
25, like, he would have been six. He was a prodigy. <laughs> no one suspected the six-year-old. And then here he comes with his lance. Give him the little baby gun. So in February of 1845, Mitchell Trelina and his thug army and the Americans met with a rebel army led by Pio Pico this Castro. Is, this, this sounds a lot more exciting than it is. Oh, no, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the yeah, rebel yeah. army, the thug, Darth Vader with his bounty hunter is coming. What's that, Darth Vader? You don't want to do this anymore? We agree. <laughs> Let's get ready for the next one. They all met north of the Coenga Pass at Rancho La Providencia, which is now Burbank. The current address is I could see it. 3204 Nichols Canyon in Burbank. Apparently, Burbank construction crews found cannonballs from the fight buried decades later. Right. So Mitchell Trelina was heavily armed, many say thanks to Sutter, and the rebel army was fine, I guess. And they all opened fire, and again, two deaths. One horse and one mule. <laughs> hey, come on. There's no way to talk about them. <laughs> but after the cannon dust settled, the rebel side decided they just wanted to come to an understanding. Too many mules have died. Two Americans, one of which may have been workmen, rose a white flag and approached the Mitchell Trelina side, led by Captain Brandt. An American would never raise a white flag against <laughs> a Mexican. <laughs> That's just in the white face constitution. The two parties met and discussed the future of California that was going to be operated by Mitchell Trelina's thugs. And he decided, hey, that's probably not the best thing ever. Pio Pico joined in and discussed with them their land grants issued by Mitchell Trelina, which was compensation for joining his army. He cleared up the misunderstanding that since they were not citizens of Mexico, their land grants meant nothing, but he promised them if they abandoned Mitchell Trelina, he would give his word of honor as a gentleman to carry out a promise of protection on the land they had now, and if they would become citizens of Mexico, he would issue them proper titles. And they dispersed, agreeing with Pico Pico's promise, which if they knew the big scheme of things, they would have been pissed that in like two years, it was going to be America anyways, they would have had their <laughs> land still. Mitchell Trelina found out that the Americans had abandoned him. hear Yankee Doodle in the distance. <laughs> What's that? What's that? No, don't worry. Don't Nothing. worry. <laughs> no. Come on. G- give me your stuff. It's a Mexican thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch Trinidad found out the Americans had abandoned him about an hour later, and that night there was a white flag hanging from his camp. Pio Pico and his team negotiated with Mitchell Trelina. There will Trilina. be no white flag hanging from my door. Pio Pico and his team negotiated with Mitchell Trelina, and he formally surrendered and agreed that him and his thugs would sail off back to Mexico. Pio Pico would be taking his place as governor of Los Angeles. I've read a lot of different things about Pio Pico. For the most part, it seems to be he's like always on the right side of the fight, usually fighting off anyone who's drunk with power. But I also read that he like sold mission lands and structures to private citizens for like major profit. That's how he got rich, which is why I imagine many of these guys were interested in secularization. Oh, we freed up this land because we don't want this to be ridiculous. Great. Uh, I want that. I want that. <laughs> he sold San Fernando mission to a private citizen, Eugenio de Salas in 1846. He did this as American troops swept across California and didn't resist them. People could not resist them at all. It's like, yep, come get it. After this point is when the real battle for Los Angeles begins. Oh, and this how many cows are going to die this time? <laughs> How many times must the cannonball fly into a horse's <laughs> face before we learn that we're all just living on the land of the Keech? <laughs> and this battle for Los Angeles did not involve aliens. Aww. Well, neither did the other one, really, but this one especially. <laughs> but all the rest. <laughs> did we mention that Pio Pico was from Venus, which is a region of Mexico? <laughs> Named after the planet. Mars. <laughs> it's very confusing. Uh, American forces had their big, dumb eyes on California. <laughs> there was a faction of Americans in the North who had grown weary of neglect full Mexican government and their subpar governors and they wanted to secede and create a California Republic which later became known as the Bear Flag Revolt. Isn't that fight still going on? Yeah. The Bear Flag Revolt was led by American Army officer and explorer John C. Fremont of what is now Sacramento. Now they got themselves into some minor battles. Fremont and the Bear Flaggers officially took command of the unguarded Presidio of San Francisco on July 1st and six days later they took the capital of Monterey which was three weeks after Pico sold the mission to Desilis. Perfect timing pal. (laughs) Fremont hooked up with the American Commodore Robert Stockton, like you mentioned, Uh and achieved the rank of lieutenant colonel. And the two men assembled a group of settlers and sharpshooters from Monterey to head south to seize Los Angeles. Oh, God. But the traffic. um, (laughs) (laughs) It took them 10 years. (laughs) The damn five freeway. They stopped at Cattleman's Ranch because that's where all of the lost herd that that Rivera had from bringing from Mexico got sent to. The cows own the land now. (laughs) They are delicious and just. So they get to Los Angeles in August of 1846 and the city is abandoned. Pico and Castro had split to Sonora to gather troops and beg the Mexican government for reinforcements. Is Sonora like our farm team? I think it's like our farm team. It's like where we go to become Californians. <laughs> so Stockton rolls up. City is empty. Easy peasy. I'll leave some of my guys here just in case. How empty are we talking? I don't think completely empty. I just don't think there's any military. Yeah. So there's just people wandering like, all right, all right. <laughs> so he left a small group there to be led by Captain Archibald Gillespie. The jazz player? <laughs> Archie G. However, all across the state, the Californios who were loyal to Mother Mexico were assembling in secret and building a resistance which oh. was which was to be led by Jose Flores.
Flores, which Stockton and Gillespie had no idea what was happening. Within a month, they chased away the Americans occupying the city government house mm. who fled to Fort Moore Hill. Listen to lizard people. <laughs> Fighting continued until September of that year when Gillespie signed an agreement that allowed him and his Marines to escape to San Pedro without getting attacked. Uh, <laughs> I like how they're like, we must retreat. Where are we going? A block away. <laughs> you can see each other. From, I from... see you. <laughs> no, we're keen. We're, we're lizard, lizard people. Really... Oh, we're cool with lizard people, right? Okay, we, we signed a treaty. Not anymore. <laughs> get them. Get them before they build tunnels. I uh, can't wait to re-listen to this episode to find out what you said because I can hear you. <laughs> you said that about my mom? <laughs> that mother, mother. But that was just a small victory and it was becoming or was the Mexican-American War. In December of that year, American troops began marching from San Diego to take New Mexico and stocked in a Fremont gathered around 1,000 men and headed towards Los Angeles. Oh, no. In January of 1847, the Battle of Los Angeles takes place on two back-to-back -back days, January 8th and January 9th. The first, on January 8th, was the Battle of Rio San Gabriel, which is now Whittier, Pico Rivera, and Montebello. They were hit hard by the Americans. Troops heading towards New Mexico met with Stockton's army, and the combined is one big army. The next day, the Battle of Mesa, which happened in Vernon, oh, was no. the last armed resistance to American domination. They were just outnumbered. The new pride of Vernon. <laughs> ah! Way to hold us down, Vernon. <laughs> Good job, Vernon. <laughs> it's weird in some places. I've read that it was a really bloody battle. In others, I read it was completely bloodless. I read that the big decision and not completely obliterating Mexico, other than it just being morally wrong to kill that many people, was that Americans had heard about the Battle of La Provincia and how it was settled by negotiations. So they said, well, if they're reasonable people, let's just <laughs> let's not kill them. Let's <laughs> kill them. I don't know if that's true or not, but on January 13th of 1847, Pio Pico's brother, Andres Pico, commander of the California Army, met with Fremont at Campo de Coenga, which is now in Studio City. It's still there, 3919 yeah. Lancaster Street. Right Boulevard. at the uh, metro station. Yeah, it's right at the metro station. Park right. there and walk into City Walk. It's free. Don't listen to this metro. Don't pay $8 to City Walk. Never give them money. You save that money for Popcornopolis. <laughs> <laughs> they met there and discussed what surrendering entailed for. <laughs> what is this word? <laughs> Does it mean we win? It means I still walk away with a lot of pride, right? <laughs> sure. Wear this. <laughs> it's a donkey costume. <laughs> We're all going to pin the tail on you. You surrender. You be the top half and your brother's your the bottom brother, right. Your brother, who looks like Herman Munster. <laughs> or the king of the Gungans. <laughs> Pico fought for and received protection for the rights of the California residents and Fremont agreed. They signed the capitulation of Coenga on the kitchen table, ending the Mexican-American War in Los Angeles. I've seen that kitchen table. Have you? It's in the Natural History Museum. Get, get out, really? I'm going to put a picture of it online. It's very, it was wait. very exciting. I'm, I'm excited to yeah. see that. It might be my favorite kitchen table. The Mexican-American War altogether ends in 1848. Pico was very pleased that their terms and agreement was so amicable that he puts it together a fiesta for Fremont and his men. So after years of neglectful rule by the Mexican government, Los Angeles is now part of the United States. Have at it, boys. And here we are. Here we are. Yeah, it's weird that all of the revolution that was going on on the East Coast was like the bloodiest yeah. war ever fought. And everyone here is like, oh my God, you shot a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Let's never do this again. We named them. <laughs> Him. His name was Sheeperly. <laughs> Listen, people died, okay? And it was very sad. And, and war is hell. I'm so glad. Negotiation is hell. Look, peace, peaceful settlement is hell. <laughs> especially when it's in Burbank. I feel like we just went through the plot of all three Lord of the Rings movies, but in a very dry way. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, definitely. As it was always critiqued a lot of walking around. Yeah. It took days to get everywhere. Well, there were so many ranchos in Middle Earth. <laughs> Rancho, Rancho the Elves. El <laughs> Rancho El Mordor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so those are the first however many years of Los Angeles. It could have ended up very differently. Yeah, it, it, it's weird to think like, what if it was still Spanish or what if it was it's still, still Mexican? Mexican? Yeah, I think about that a lot. Yeah, yeah. I bet you do. <laughs> I, this every, every every Mexican assembly I go to, we talk about what, what oh, could have been. You're not supposed to know about those. <laughs> Delete this part. They're going to kill me. Gonna kill Somehow my I'm invited to the Mexican yeah. ones. They got very confused by my last name. I do read about a lot of Mexican people who have red hair. You would fit right in. <laughs> I don't want people stalking me. Oh, yeah, you're right. Going right, after right, right, every right. red haired Which person. Which is why, if you're wondering why our Instagram has no pictures of us, it's because of that. <laughs> Look. I'm hideous. <laughs> I might be Quasimodo. I'm sorry. You know the elephant man? <laughs> Combine him with the Phantom of the Opera, <laughs> and you've got my better looking brother. <laughs> okay, so those that was the founding of Los Angeles. We were both very interested in doing that. and uh, It had to be done. Yeah, it's, it's good for you. It's, <laughs> I think as time passes, we might start picking little things apart and analyzing them a little bit closer. We just wanted yeah, to give them... This a, was the general yeah, overview. Yeah, yeah. This should have been the first episode, yeah, really. really. We yeah. figured, hey, the city started when the library started. <laughs> <laughs> I like doing the research for this podcast because it allows me to actually 
actually it gives me a reason to go out there and like sit there and read about it that's another thing i mean because everyone always says like oh this is la it used to be mexico anyway like it was originally mexico's anyway yeah it really wasn't like mexico was playing with it mexico yeah i mean it was spain's yeah first it was the quiches it was first. the quiches first yeah. and then spain's and then mexico so like everyone's yeah we're all just a place marker yeah place marker yeah who yeah. knows who's gonna control los angeles <laughs> will it be you you let us know now because we'll 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 pay you because <laughs> we'll mention you on the next episode yeah, 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 you know? yeah. We'll, we'll tag we, you whatever you need you need like two podcasters to live in your court sure we'll do it we'll do anything you want podcasting live from the king of <laughs> whatever you want my lord um your humble squire or my lord s or oh yeah it might be an army of Please, women Greg. oh no, oh, no. they'll pick on me bite your tongue <laughs> they're gonna give me a wedgie they'll reject me how can i love that many women i don't even know whatever they want <laughs> so it's good knowing this now and now that we keep going further and further we keep making more and more connections to other episodes and i'm which me and you talked about before like we're building like this bigger web since we're not going in any order it's like webbing to like oh now i get this now i get this yeah. now i get this and we're like building our own history we hope uh you have a happy thanksgiving yes i also hope you had a nice halloween the time has passed for that we don't speak about that anymore Aww. you have a happy thanksgiving <laughs> you watch the macy's day parade and the rose bowl or whatever which one's which <laughs> i can't tell yeah have a good thanksgiving yes, eat please. turkey eat giblets gizzards uh, gizzards the hearts. hearts yeah smear it on your doorstep <laughs> let your neighbors know that you're a little bit off there's something wrong with you but you know we can't get you arrested you're not doing anything illegal yeah, but well, we still eat well yeah so don't report us. You should report to iTunes yes. to leave a review. Follow us on Facebook, LA Meekly. Mm-hmm. Let's go into detail a little bit. Yeah. In 2004, <laughs> Mark, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg fade in, Jesse Eisenberg, <laughs> arguing with someone at a bar or something like that. On Facebook, we put articles of stuff, yeah. things that are going on in town. Twitter, we try to, we try we to do as much as we can. At LA Meekly. Instagram, we post a lot of fun pictures yeah. of stuff around town that you can see. LA underscore Meekly. Meekly. Send us an email. Any questions? comments ally.meekly at gmail.com our host blog page is ally.meekly.tumblr.com that's you the could find springboard our, into the, all of this you could find an archive of our episodes if you get curious mm-hmm. you can watch our live webcams <laughs> there's no live one day we might be on periscope <laughs> filming our faces who knows maybe one day daniel will lighten up that's the problem i can't be in light <laughs> <laughs> i'm not for raw i've said that that's canon <laughs> We hope you found this interesting. You might be able to interest someone at a party one day. Use this information on Thanksgiving dinner. Tell all of your aunts and uncles, hey, did you know that this happened? And, you know, start a little bit of a fight. This is the perfect springboard to you coming out to all of your family. (laughs) (laughs) You ever heard about Andres Pio Pico? I'm gay. (laughs) It works like a charm. We support the lesbian and gay community. Absolutely. We support all communities. Yeah, we do. As long as they adopt us. As long as you leave us a review, we we will back any crazy ideas you got. But if you don't... (laughs) We'll cut you. Cut you deep. Out of our lives. Out of our lives. Uh, uh, Cut you deep out of our lives. lives. Yes, please. All right. That's been yet another episode 23 of LA Meekly. Somehow we've been doing this two years now, but this isn't the... 24th, 24th episode. Yeah, it's weird. But this is... We haven't gotten better. Nope. So that's been another episode of LA Meekly. Peacefully transitioning between controlling nations since 2013 and 1781. Remember, we were talking about it the whole time. Don't cut me off. Mm-hmm.